For centuries, the field of black holes has been shrouded in mystery and terror, as physicists grapple with the terrifying concept of singularities, points of infinite density where the known laws of physics break down. Singularities have been accepted, albeit problematically, as the cornerstone of black hole theory. But what if this fundamental idea, which has endured for generations, were about to be overturned? This is where Roy Kerr, a legendary figure in black hole research, comes in. His recent paper suggests a revolutionary idea. The singularity at the heart of a black hole may not exist at all. If Kerr is right, the very structure of our understanding of black holes, and perhaps the universe itself, could be fundamentally altered. It's rare that a giant of physics threatens to overturn an idea that generations of physicists have taken for granted. Well, that may be the fate of Penrose's famous singularity theorem, if a recent paper by Roy Kerr is to be believed. In short, the terrifying singularity at the center of a black hole may have disappeared. A few hundred years ago, Isaac Newton figured out how gravity works, and suddenly a lot of mysteries made more sense, from why apples fall from trees to the motion of planets and stars. But that discovery also gave rise to a new, stranger mystery. It raised the possibility that the gravity of a sufficiently dense object could create an event horizon, or dead-end surface, capable of trapping light. It raised the specter of black holes, whose paradoxical nature still plagues physics today. Einstein's update of Newtonian gravity seemed to confirm the theoretical view of black holes. It also revealed something even more puzzling to physics. The first solution to the equations of general relativity, the Schwarzschild solution, suggested that at the very center of a black hole there was a singularity. At this hypothetical point of infinite density and gravity, general relativity clashed horribly with quantum mechanics. On the scale of the singularity, our two ultimate theories of the physical world have been shown to be incompatible. Many, perhaps most, physicists were actually uncomfortable with the idea of black hole singularities, and they became even more uncomfortable when in 1965 the British physicist Sir Roger Penrose showed that singularities are indeed inevitable in general relativity. His Penrose Singularity Theorem, for which he won the Nobel Prize in 2020, states that as long as the event horizon exists, the singularity must also exist. Perhaps the most important significance of the singularity theorem is to show that general relativity is actually in fundamental conflict with quantum mechanics. If that's true, then the only salvation from the singularity paradox is a larger theory combining quantum mechanics and general relativity in which the singularity evaporates as if it were just a nightmare. Ignorant physics in the 20th century. But recently, we got a glimmer of hope from a completely unexpected direction. In a paper published in December, Roy Kerr, one of the greatest black hole theorists of all time, may have shown that we can finally avoid the black hole singularity without resorting to quantum mechanics. To achieve this completely new result, we have to gain some understanding. So let's refresh our knowledge of black holes and review Penrose's singularity theorem. Then we can decide whether Roy Kerr really did destroy the singularity. First, Roger Penrose did not exactly prove the existence of singularities. Not clearly, anyway. He proved that the paths of space-time must end inside a black hole. Anything that moves through space-time solely under the influence of gravity obeys what is called geodesy. It is a path through space-time that minimizes the combined spatial and temporal distance traveled. Before Penrose's singularity theorem, it was generally accepted that geodesy had no end. An object can move along a geodesic, a ball thrown down a parabola, for example but the geodesic itself can be traced both backwards and forwards apart from the ball's path going forward forever into the expanding universe or backwards. The beginning of the universe. Roger Penrose showed that inside a black hole, the geodesic must converge towards the center and end there. When a space-time admits that the geodesic does not last forever, we say that space-time is geodesically incomplete. You can think of geodesics as lines on the space-time grid, forming a smooth, if sometimes quite distorted, fabric on which the laws of physics operate. Geodesic incompleteness means that there are pinched-off regions where infinity appears and the laws of physics break down. So Penrose's argument is that geodesic incompleteness means singularity. But Kerr rejects this argument, and it depends on a subtle interpretation of geodesic incompleteness. So let's dig a little deeper. When Penrose says that the geodesic captured by a black hole will end up at the center of the black hole, 
he means something very specific mathematically. He means that the geodesic parameter is bounded. So the mathematical variable we use to describe the evolution of something along a geodesic endpoint is like the way your latitude ends if you go to the South Pole. You can't go any further south once your south has reached its maximum. For geodesics describing the trajectory of matter, the geodesic parameter can and often is considered to be proper time. It is simply the time measured by a person moving along that path. So if the geodesic parameter of matter is bounded, this would imply a singularity because there is no way to track the flow of time through it. There is no meaningful way to define, after, the singularity in space or time. These are deadlocks in space-time. However, Penrose builds his argument using the trajectories of light, not matter. And it turns out that the distinction is important, as we shall see. However, the general argument that geodesic incompleteness leads to a singularity is a sufficiently convincing argument that, for nearly 60 years, almost all of us have agreed that pure general relativity requires singularities. Stephen Hawking even used Penrose's arguments to show that, in pure general relativity, the Big Bang was also a singularity. All geodesics drawn backward in time must converge and end at a point. But Roy Kerr, at least, had his doubts. Kerr was a New Zealand physicist who in 1963 invented the Kerr measure, a mathematical description of a rotating black hole. It was the second black hole solution to Einstein's equations to be discovered 47 years after Carl Schwarzschild's. This only describes the much simpler case of a non-rotating black hole. Now, we have good reason to believe that all real black holes have some spin, so Kerr's solution is a big problem. Just like Roy Kerr. Roy Kerr does not agree that singularities exist, or even that Penrose's singularity theorem says anything about their existence. Let's finally get to the heart of his objection. So I told you that geodesic incompleteness has been interpreted to mean that space-time paths end which in turn is interpreted to mean that singularities are real. But there is a catch to this argument. Penrose builds his argument using a specific type of geodesic, the zero geodesic. These are space-time paths traveled by massless, illuminated objects. A zero geodesic represents the shortest path between two points in a curved space. Okay, so what does it mean when a geodesic zero ends? It means that its geodesic parameter must be bounded and cannot increase indefinitely. In the case of massive particles, we use proper time to track these regular geodesics. But objects moving at the speed of light don't know time. Their clocks remain frozen. Therefore, proper time does not increase along a geodesic zero. To describe the geodesic motion of light, we need another measure. We use something called an affine parameter, which is a bit complicated. But the point is that it increases in a clear, understandable way to track progress along a zero geodesic. Penrose's theorem shows very convincingly that affine parameters are bounded inside black holes, and so zero geodesics terminate. He then uses this to deduce the necessity of singularities being dead ends in the space-time mesh. But Kerr points out that these affine parameters do not track time in any meaningful way, and therefore do not imply that the space-time mesh collapses at the end of the zero geodesic. To illustrate this roughly, the affine parameter might be an exponential function of coordinate time. This function is bounded from below, even though time can go from negative to plus infinity. Therefore, this bounding of the affine parameter does not mean that time itself stops, argues Roy Kerr. He also argues that this invalidates any argument for the inevitability of singularities due to dead ends in the coordinate system. Kerr's paper is quite interesting to read. To put it mildly, he was sarcastic and repeatedly criticized the physics community for blindly following a conclusion that he believed was based on sand. I have placed a link to the article in the description for your entertainment. Another important part of Karen Damp's argument concerns the difference between real black holes and the idealized black holes analyzed in Penrose's paper. Essentially all, and perhaps all, real black holes must have some rotation. Real astrophysical black holes would obey the Kerr measurement and not the Schwarzschild measurement. And the same argument can be extended to charged black holes. Kerr black holes do not have a singularity in the center. In the Kerr metric, the singularity is stretched into an annular singularity, a string of infinite curvature. But Kerr asserts that even this is not a true singularity. Another interesting aspect of the Kerr measurement is that the collapse towards the singularity is inevitable as in the Schwarzschild measurement. 
There is a region just below the Kerr event horizon where collapse is truly inevitable. Beyond the event horizon, all paths lead downward, like a swart shield black hole, but not towards the center. In a rotating black hole, the centrifugal effect of the rotating spacetime reflects the force of gravity, creating this inner region of almost normal spacetime. Ina Kerr black hole, there is an inner horizon, and once you pass through it, you are free to move in any direction, even upwards. So what is this ring singularity? Kerr implied that this was a mathematical fiction. It was simply a convenient way to represent the gravitational field generated by a rotating object. It suggested that a collapsed star would actually exist in an extended physical form inside the inner horizon. Kerr supported his argument by showing that, contrary to the conclusion of Penrose's singularity theorem, not all zero geodesics end up at the singularity in the Kerr black hole, even if their affine parameters are finite. It revealed families of geodesics that cross the event horizon inside the Kerr black hole and continue to exist forever, effectively tracing any path inside the black hole without having to collide with the hypothetical singularity and cease to exist. This contradicts the previous belief that light passing through the event horizon of any black hole must end up at the supposed central singularity. That is, if the Kerr black hole ring singularity exists as a meaningful entity, rather than as a mathematical convenience as Roy Kerr believed. So what does all this actually mean for the existence of singularities? Well, it is important to understand that Kerr's argument does not necessarily say that singularities do not exist. He says that the conclusion of the proof of the singularity theorem may be incorrect. He said that bounded affine parameters for zero geodesics do not imply a singularity, contrary to the usual interpretation of Penrose's singularity theorem. Few physicists actually believe that black hole singularities exist, but most think we should use quantum mechanics to understand why. This is why Karen's article is surprising. It could pave the way for us to beat the singularity without having to wait for the elusive theory of quantum gravity. So there's still work to be done to see whether Karen's ideas hold up to scrutiny, and we're confident that there will be lively debates on both sides. But at the same time, we now have reason to be less fearful about the interior of black holes from a theoretical point of view.